for many people, there's a certain stigma associated with mental health. And the challenge for many people is that comes from internal and often leads to feelings of shame and low self-esteem. Obviously, there is an important social stigma associated with that, where people might experience prejudice or discrimination against people with mental health issues. The important aspect of this is that these are incredibly common in people with osteoarthritis. And historically, we're either A, internalized by the people who are affected and they didn't bring it up, or poorly recognized by clinicians, or both. Um, and until relatively recently, the importance of those mental health constructs and their contribution to disease went unrecognized. In this day and age, we speak a lot about the importance of psychosocial aspects to the experience of living with osteoarthritis. And many of those psychological aspects we'll talk about today, in particular, talk about aspects of sensitization, fear of movement, depression, anxiety, and in addition, some of the important social constructs, particularly that aspect of social determinants of health. Now, again, it's an incredibly complex area, one I'm trying to dig into a little bit further to, again, reduce the mystery, to increase the transparency, to hopefully increase the volume of conversations and the recognition happening in this space so that both for people that have osteoarthritis and the clinicians that are looking after them, they dig more into this space. We're incredibly fortunate today to have an opportunity to have a conversation with a clinician who thinks about this, not a trained psychologist, but an orthopedic surgeon. And that might sound incredibly counterintuitive, but we're really, really fortunate to have Dr. Brian Tan on today's show to talk about this really important aspect of health and caring for people with osteoarthritis. Brian's an orthopedic surgeon scientist in Singapore whose research focuses on health service research, implementation science, population health, and taking a biopsychosocial perspective in musculoskeletal health. Hello, Brian. Welcome to the show. Hi, David. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, it's a it's a great pleasure. I'm very much looking forward to visiting your hometown relatively soon and enjoying some wonderful hospitality, Brian style, and uh, not sure what that will be this time, but irrespective, <laughs> very much looking forward to it. Now, Brian, before I get too uh, on a different trajectory, can you just share with the listeners a little bit more about your background and what a typical day looks like? Uh, so my name is Brian, and, and again, no, thank you very much, David, for inviting me on this podcast. I've been following it quite closely uh, over the past uh, few months, and, and it's been uh, it's been really, really informative about the many, many uh, topics within osteoarthritis. So, I mean, I, I'm an orthopedic surgeon scientist, so my typical day, you know, revolves around like three large components. One is my clinical life as an orthopedic surgeon, seeing patients, seeing patients in the clinic, operating in the operating theatre. Uh, you know, doing walk rounds. The uh, second part of my life is my research life, where I focus on health services research, implementation science, health economics, and really taking a public and population health approach to musculoskeletal work. And the third part of my life is uh, on policy and administration, where I sit on several um, hospital and national uh, committees and work groups looking at trying to transform the musculoskeletal care in Singapore across the entire healthcare continuum. You don't sound like you have enough going on, Brian, but of of those three hats that you, that you wear, presumably daily, which of those do you enjoy most and which do you find most fulfilling? I Well, that, that's David, you touched on a very uh, pertinent point there. And the problem of me or the problem I have is that I enjoy all three very much so. And so it's very hard for me to kind of give up any one of them. And I find that actually each of them inform the other parts of the work I do. Treating patients and seeing patients helps me understand the problems and it helps me um, you know, understand what sort of research questions I should take. And then based on the research that we do, we are then able to inform policy in a better way. So everything kind of works together in a sort of a tripartite manner. No, it's a, it's a great way to be. And if you can maintain that existence, that's absolutely wonderful. But can you just provide a little bit of insights as to the tolerance or otherwise of your bosses in clinical medicine or academia for the other? 
Yeah. Uh, again, uh, uh, David didn't expect you to be asking such difficult questions at the start, <laughs> but 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 you know you're, you're right, right? Most of us tend to reside in one or the other sort of uh, ecosystem. Yeah. If you're a clinician, you are based primarily in the clinical work, and you tend not to veer too far out of it. If you're in the research world, you tend to stay very much in the research and academic world, and then uh, you know, and and of course the policy makers are something else. But I I find that. Uh, progressively, uh, while there were initial teething issues and, and difficulty in helping each side understand the work that I do, uh, by bringing value add from the other side, new perspectives and new ideas that come from being on the other side, for example, from the clinical work, I can understand from a research perspective why certain decisions are being made or from a policy perspective, why certain policies are being made that on the ground people say, why are this policy being done? And because I sit on that lens or wear that hat, I understand uh, why that decision is being taken, but you know, it, it's a it's a fairly lonely path. I'll be fair to say, and uh, not everybody understands uh, the kind of work that I do. Yeah, well, full credit to you, and you're obviously making a massive difference. So continue, continue along the same road. But um, when you're not busily doing your day job, what do you enjoy doing? Uh, well, <laughs> to be fair, there's not much else or much much time left. But the remaining time, I try to spend as much as I can with my, my wife and kids. I have three young kids. David, I know you have kids too, and a lot of kids too. And, and so, you know, balancing the family, and we had many chats about that before, it's a struggle. And, uh, and you know, just, just as a little story, uh, you know, sometimes you get so busy with work that my wife, during, I, I mentioned uh, earlier in our chat that we just had the uh, musculoskeletal day over the weekend. And what happened was that my wife brought the kids to sit in the audience and listen to me as we were you know, doing the panel discussion and having the talks. And, you know, sometimes that's where work and family kind of intermingles. But by all seriousness, uh, you know, whatever remaining time I have is really either to spend time with the family, going on adventures, looking for the next playground or water park, for, for that matter, or the rest of the time is usually in church uh, serving. So those are the kind of my two big areas outside of uh, my work. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, just out of interest, do the kids um, stay attentive during the, your presentations? Oh, I was really stressed because I was worried that if I suddenly stand up and say something, you know, in the audience of like the senior management of the hospital and, you know, big, you know, CEOs of different organizations there and you see my seven-year-old, eight-year-old son there is kind of making a mockery of funny faces. Uh, it can be a bit stressful when you're trying to, to concentrate on the talk you're giving. But anyway, you know, it was really a pleasure to have them there and ha have them sort of see that kind of work that I do. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm I'm sure they had a good time and I'm sure it's incredibly valuable for them seeing what dad does um, and uh, looking at the difference that he does make. Now, Brian, if you had to describe yourself in five words, what would they be? Uh, I Well, I had some trouble thinking of five. Uh, maybe can I just give you three, if you don't mind, David? Perfect. So, perfect. so the, the three Ps, I'm passionate, I'm positive, and I'm a people person. So I think the three Ps, passionate that I'm, I really am very passionate about the work and do very driven and I give 100% to, to whatever I'm doing. I'm very positive in that I see, I tend to be the cup half full kind of guy and not the cup, uh, cup half empty. And I'm a kind of a people person, you know, I really enjoy being around people and, and I, I draw my energy uh, from being around people and getting ideas and having conversations. So yeah, the three Ps. Yeah, One, wonderful qualities and I'm sure they've stood you in good stead um, and I hope they continue to do so. Now, Obviously, today we're talking about a topic which probably doesn't necessarily flow easily off the tongue of most orthopedic surgeons, and I'm not necessarily branding you as such, but can you just tell me a little bit in the first instance, before we get into the main content, what motivated you to go into the research area that you've chosen? Well, uh, maybe uh, it might be a little bit of a long story, but I sort of share a little bit about how uh, it came about. You know, as an orthopedic registrar or trainee, Ben, I, I, you know, I used to run many, many clinics and you have 10, 20, 30 patients come through your clinic, many of them with osteoarthritis. And so, you know, what you would do in a typical clinic setting, in, all you have is kind of five minutes with the patient. You come in, you look at the x-ray, you say, look, you have bad arthritis, you need to exercise, you need to lose weight. And then you refer them to the therapist and, and off you go in the next patient. And it's a repeated cycle. And really what sort of drew me to this is because I was getting very dissatisfied with the kind of ways that we were dealing with that. And because I knew deep in my heart, as many clinicians know, that when you tell the patient that 95% of them will not make any change to their lifestyle. 
and they'll come back six months later with pain and with poor function and you know and you really wish you could do more and so what we did is we started a program called connect the collaborative model of care between orthopedics and our health uh, care professional and really inspired by programs like yours david uh, at the oaccp program in australia that i had a great chance to visit a couple of years back that kind of seeded the idea in my mind to say that we need to do something different and so we started the connect program uh, in Singapore. And this program was based in the community. And we started to uh, try and get patients to be more active, talk about psychological empowerment, social support, so and so forth. Uh, and, and really, as the program grew, I realized that it was just so much in this area that I didn't know that I was so sheltered and siloed within the surgical realm in the in the hospital. And so about the same time, uh, sort of the route to become a clinician scientist came out at that point. And and then this whole area of health services uh, research started to come out. And that's how everything kind of clicked in you know, community work with uh, research and bring it all together. And so that, that was how I, I kind of moved into this area very, very unintentionally and very unplanned, to be frank, to be fair with you. I, th- I think for a lot of people in medicine, the path that they choose tends to be one where an opportunity uh, presents itself or a great need presents itself. And you then pour your effort and energy into addressing what presumably at that point was a huge unmet need. Um, and, you know, an opportunity to critically make a difference, which is, I think, what drives us all in medicine. So, you know, I think a key element of this is reframing the way we think about disease. Um, and you've been front and center and really thinking about, uh, I guess, shifting us from what is currently framed as a biomedical to more of a biopsychosocial approach. Can you just help me to understand what those terms mean to you? Well, to me, a biomedical approach is what has been traditionally practiced. There is a biomedical or biological issue, right? And so, you know, like say, take osteoarthritis, for example, is the the degeneration or the wear and tear or however terminology you like to use about your cartilage wearing down and eventually causing that pain and dysfunction. And it's purely a biological or mechanistic process that's happening and therefore uh, explains the pain, the dysfunction, the poor quality of life that the patients have. But increasingly, we are realizing that, uh, particularly in musculoskeletal health, that the level of quality of your so-called degeneration or the severity of disease has no correlation how much pain or uh, functional loss somebody has. And so how do we explain this this disconcordance or this difference that we see? And that's really where the biopsychosocial comes into play, where you realize that it's just beyond the biological explanation, but the psychological and social elements that really all come together that help to explain why patients feel the way they do, why some of them do well, why some of them do poorly, why some can cope better, why somebody can live with a disease and thrive despite having a disease and others with less severe disease on paper seem to struggle so much. So really that's where the biopsychosocial model takes a very holistic approach uh, to that. You know, One of the landmark papers that has come out in recent years is where we talk about the fact that the quality of healthcare uh, only actually determines about 10% of your health. And the other 90% is determined by things like genetics, behavior, environment. And so for far too long, we have focused our attention and efforts on that 10% without realizing that there's this whole 90% that we are not having, you know, we aren't having a great understanding about and most certainly not doing much about. So I think that's really where this biopsychosocial really tries to address that paradigm shift. Yeah. So let's, let's dig a little bit further into some of those constructs that might help to explain as you said, some of that discordance between the biology, so the severity or extent of disease, and what a person experiences, which, you know, and let's let's talk about, I guess, the mental health constructs first, and then come back to some of those social uh, determinants that you've also been involved in. But in the first instance, what aspects of mental health are important in contributing to some of that uh, discordance or and or the experience of a person living with osteoarthritis. Yeah, uh, it, it is a great question, and you know, mental health. I mean, mental health as a whole has really come into the forefront in the past. I would say five to ten years, people are realizing more and more and more that mental health is important. You know, people. Uh, there are people struggling with mental health, and many people struggling with mental health, and it really affects uh, people's quality of life. I need to give a caveat, uh, David that I am not a psychologist. I'm far, in fact, I'm the complete opposite of a psychologist. But actually, ironically, I think that by not being a psychologist, I see these 
mental constructs or this mental health in a very layman perspective, if you get what I'm saying. That means, you know, we don't have to, to over... Just, just yeah. To inter- yeah, I mean, just to interrupt for a second, I think part yeah. of, part of just so you clearly understand it, part of the motivation for wanting to have this conversation is that you are not a psychologist, but you are, okay. <laughs> you're, a, you're an orthopedic clinician in the coalface, so to speak, yeah. seeing people day to day who are affected by this illness, yes. seeing these issues that are not biological yeah. um, and having to deal with them and think about and framing how we best deal with it. So that's to be, if I'm completely honest, that's why we're having this conversation. Um, Thanks, David. Thanks for just, uh, you know, boosting my self-confidence right there. <laughs> but but yeah, no, really, again, like I said, the, the caveat is I'm not a psychologist, but I work very closely with psychologists and many of them, and they help me understand. They they, they give me frameworks to help me understand. There are then many different frameworks. Uh, the one that I work with uh, is by Mel Zach and Kills, uh, Casey. Talks about uh, the three different types. There's sensory discriminatory, which is a sort of pain sensitization. The second sort of domain is a cognitive evaluative, where that's where your kinesophobia, your catastrophizing all comes in. <clears throat> and the third large group is uh, effective motivational, which is the one that has been most studied because it looks at depression, anxiety, and all that. But, you know, just just take something again. So these are the constructs that the psychologists have, you know, helped me understand uh, and, and sort of help me group these different mental uh, health constructs uh, inside. But <clears throat> just take a simple model, for example, the fear avoidance model. I think something that, that's familiar with many of us, you know, from the same injury that or, or pain that someone takes, the interpretation can be so different from one where someone is has no fear, has a very positive attitude to say, okay, I can overcome it, I can confront it, and they go across uh, towards the path of recovery. But in the same fear avoidant model, you have someone who experiences the exact same pain, but suddenly has the negative effect coming in, has the pain catastrophizing, has the fear, has all these negative thoughts come in, and then overwhelms them, and then they start to do uh, avoid the activity, start to stay at home, start to avoid going out, avoid physical activity, and then progressively they enter this vicious cycle of progressive disuse and sarcopenia and osteoporosis and osteoarthritis, and then it goes into this vicious cycle where they get weaker and weaker and the pain gets worse. So how can you explain how someone from the exact same inciting event can take two so very different paths? That is something that really puzzles me. Uh, but yet, it's something I think we we really ought to understand, so that we can try and help push our patients towards the positive recovery uh, trajectory rather than a negative, tra- and really stem the 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 descent or the decline into this negative vicious cycle that we see many of our patients in. Yeah, I mean it's an incredibly important problem, and I, I guess just to distill some of what you were saying there, which obviously relates very much to that aspect of what we call kinesiophobia, so fear of movement. And you and others have done wonderful work in this space that really demonstrate quite clearly that those people that have that fear of movement with the same level or extent of uh, disease have much lower physical activity. And as you just said, that has a lot of downstream consequences, whether that be on um, ability to participate or social isolation and, and a number of other uh, key elements there. While we're talking about it, um, how do you assess this in your research? And have you done any assessment of this in clinical practice? Yep, uh, that's, that's a great question. So kinesophobia specifically is something I think is very understudied. Uh, it's very poorly understood. And it's something that is kind of come to the foray again, as I mentioned, the last sort of five years or so. Uh, in terms of assessment, there are established measures, uh, the TAMPA kinesophobia scale, and uh, I think most recently it has been shortened. And the one we use is the brief fear of movement scale, which is a shortened version of the uh, TAMPA scale. I, I, I believe it's just six items that really uh, helps to measure these kinesophobia uh, symptoms and these kin- uh, kinesophobia constructs. But actually beyond measuring, which is something I advocate highly within the clinical setting to measure uh, these things and actually we've done some work locally to validate that measure uh, and, and really look at how we can integrate that measure within our, our clinical practice. It's actually just enabling or just erasing the awareness among clinicians that these sort of psychological issues are present. Because in truth, it is something that we as clinicians instinctively will know. You have someone coming in, they are, they are moving gingerly, they are, you know, they are a bit afraid of you to touch their limb, they are a bit sensitive whenever you move their joint, 
you know, these, these, as compared to someone coming in who has, you know, it has that, despite having the same sort of pain, as we mentioned earlier, uh, it's much more amenable to movement and it has less fear. You know, innately, you know, you as a clinician will have the sense that this patient is not likely to do well. And so is that instinct, that instinct that is really there that we're trying to measure, become more, uh, you know, raised to a higher profile through through methods like through research and, and to really then advocate for the fact that we should be intervening and trying to address such fear, such kinesophobia, because you know that it impacts outcomes significantly. Yeah, no, wonderful, and it's a fantastic description. I'm not necessarily going to get into the sensory discriminatory aspect of what you were speaking about, because I think at least from a pain sensitization standpoint, we've had other wonderful guests come on this podcast, uh, Lisa Caleso amongst them, that have spoken at length about uh, pain sensitization. But wondering if you could just make at least a few comments about the importance of um, depression or anxiety, particularly based upon, um, again, the work that you've done, uh, particularly as it relates to the discordance uh, between um, self-reported and, and observed uh, physical function. Uh, yeah, thanks, David. I think the, the thing about depression anxiety, so uh, as, as you know, we, we are currently about in the midst of finishing up a scoping review, looking at uh, many of these psychosocial factors within knee osteoarthritis. And uh, depression anxiety is very, very well studied in terms of the quantity of literature that's out there. But the, the thing about depression and anxiety is that, and, and we've done recent work to show that how depression uh, and anxiety actually is one of the, the drivers that explain that disconcordance. Uh, we recently published a paper that looked at uh, how that depression sort of, ex or that, that anxiety sort of explained why the differences between the objective measures and the subjective measures that, that we took. Uh, but one of the things that we are trying to understand more into further research is really what is the chicken and what is the egg? Which is which? Is it someone who de is depressed at the start? That's the sort of the starting point that eventually experiences worse symptoms because of the fact that they had symptoms and then they, they spiral into depression and then they went into the depression cycle. So really, I think that's where we're trying to deep dive and understand a bit more through both qualitative and quantitative methods to see really what is chicken and egg, what is the real relationship and what are sort of the mediators and moderating relationships among the other psychological factors because I don't think we can see these things in isolation. Uh, I think we've had conversations about that before, that you cannot just say depression alone is sort of the, the be and any all, or kinesophobia alone, but rather it's very interconnected, intertwined relationships between these various uh, psychological factors that eventually uh, end up with a patient, uh, you know, presentation or, or symptomatology. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant description. Um, wondering if we could just talk at least briefly about the social aspect of the psychosocial. Um, and not necessarily getting into some of the socioeconomic determinants here, but probably another area that you've been quite passionately involved in is that of social determinants of health. Um, and I wonder if you could just make at least a few comments about, A, what that is, and potentially how that also might contribute to some of the lived experience in a person who has osteoarthritis. So we, we've looked at some of the literature in this area. I think things like income status and housing and all that tend to be fairly well studied. You know, generally they come from a poorer neighborhood, uh, their income level is lower, they tend to experience uh, poor outcomes. But these other areas that are less objective are things like things like social support, things like the occupation, things uh, like the built environment. These are areas which we are trying to move into as less studied, less understood areas and how they, they, they work on one of the big areas of research that we're looking at now uh, is a research program called BFIT, the built, built Environment in Arthritis and Falls. And I'll tell you that it was actually driven by a patient story that we had very early in the Connect program. My research assistant came out to me and said, you know, Dr. Brian, there's this patient that, you know, she really wants to join the program, but, she, but she's refusing to come to the center to get exercise. And I said, no, why? You know, what, what's the problem? We are really paying for the, ex you, know, you know, at a point in time, we were actually giving them vouchers to offset the entire cost of the program. And then ultimately, finally, we, we, we got out what the problem was. And the problem was between the bus, bus stop and the rehab center, there was an overhead bridge that they had to cross. And because of that overhead bridge, she refused to come to the center because it was too painful for her to walk up. And then we started to realize, look, actually the built environment has a big part to play in the fact that uh, why patients are behaving the way they are doing and how it impacts their physical activity uh, level. You know, that, that's just a, a one example of, of built environment and social determinants. Of course, the other one, again, is social support. And one of the things I, I would highlight about social support is that it's not 
as simple as we think it is. We are, we are about to uh, publish a paper looking at the differences between the social support from family members, from co-workers, from colleagues, and from other sort of extended family. And you realize that the nuances between each of them are different. And in the different cultures, where certain cultures tend to be more uh, individualistic and more cultures tend to be collectivist, uh, the interpretation of the same social support construct becomes very different. So again, we, we really have to take the lens of which uh, sort of culture and context a patient is in to understand how that social support actually impacts uh, someone's uh, outlook or interpretation of their symptoms. And that's a great segue into something that, you know, at least in uh, briefly looking at your, the wonderful research that you're doing, you did some work specifically looking at psychosocial factors in Asian patients with knee osteoarthritis. And you mentioned this concept of loss of face. Can you just tell me a little bit about what loss of face is and the impact that that might have for those people that have that? So in the Chinese culture or in the Asian culture, there's this thing that face is a big uh, issue. And, and uh, you know, there are these Chinese terms called uh, tiu lian, or, or it basically means to throw your face away. Or, you know, when you, face is a very important concept in, in the Asian Chinese culture. And so the, the external appearance or perception of somebody is important. And so we realized that through our interviews that patients that, were you know perceived to have gait abnormalities or had to use walking sticks that external perception of rather the fact that they were seen to be disabled became a big problem for them and many of them actually preferred then to stay at home they didn't want to go out they didn't want to interact they didn't want to socialize and there begins the spiral again towards depression and towards social isolation and so that that face uh, really became a, a thing and beyond actually just qualitative work uh, we've started to look at it from a quantitative perspective. There is a scale that we've tried to use called the Chronic Illness Shame Scale, SCISS. And we've also, again, measured some of these shame or the shame construct within many patients and, again, looked at how we correlated with outcomes. And, and unsurprisingly, the fact that with people with more shame, uh, experience of shame had worse outcomes as well. So, you know, it, it's really a, a growing area of research that I find uh, that, that's really, really fascinating to me. And I really hope to to see how we can understand more about this in the years to come. Yeah, wonderful and s tremendous insights. And hopefully more people will become more attuned to identifying these. Now, for clinicians, we started touching upon this in terms of being intuitive or at least in touch and trying to identify specifically uh, what's going on. You started talking about some of the characteristics that these people might have when they present to you in clinical practice. Um can you just briefly go over them? And again, if you can just touch upon what you might do about that, if you find something. So I think uh, as in terms of what we can do as clinicians or what we should be doing is, you know, at a very basic level, we should be raising awareness uh, among our fellow clinicians or even among ourselves that these things do exist. And if and if we want our patients to get better, and we do, all of us want our patients to get better, uh, it is imperative that we recognize them and we you know diagnose them or at least get them the help that they can receive either from an allied healthcare professional or social worker or psychologist uh, that may be able to help them to address that problem. But the first step is to recognize that we have a problem. Taking the next step, and I know some centers around the world have started to do that, is where they have created these multidisciplinary in, uh, integrated programs where they have integrated psychologists and social workers within their clinical construct or team where uh, the patient's able to, and, and as part of that process, they actually embed a screening criteria as part of that uh, workflow when the patients come in. So if they hit certain criteria, they immediately get assessed by a psychologist or social worker, and then they get uh, they get the appropriate treatment on the same day. And so taking just beyond just an individual clinical level, but actually at a clinical program level or programmatic level, you're able to embed many of these uh, screening tools uh, and intervention within a sort of daily practice. So really at a hospital or clinician level, that's, that's one of the things that we can do, I feel. Yeah. And, you know, not everybody is obviously in the fortunate position that we are, but, you know, really just to encourage people to be aware that these problems are incredibly prevalent amongst the people who out there who are living with osteoarthritis and their under recognition has often led to lack of ability to engage properly 
uh, with care and obviously um, reductions in quality of life and lack of participation. So their recognition is really key and essential and the, the critical role that people with psychological training can have in recognizing these and, and doing something about it is, is vital for the care of people that have osteoarthritis. Now, Brian, that was obviously just an incredibly quick cooks tour through some of the wonderful work that you've done. Is there anything else that you wanted to highlight? We'll obviously include some of the links that you shared in the show notes, but is there anything else particularly that you wanted to share with us before we get into some closing questions? Um, I would say that really it's an area that I think potentially, for example, artificial intelligence may really help us in this area. You know, as we try and un uncover these mental constructs, and these uh, social constructs and how they intertwine. And I alluded to the fact earlier that the relationships are so complex. Uh, sometimes it's actually beyond uh, any uh, routine sort of statistical analysis uh, that might help us uncover what are these uh, sort of patterns, so to speak. And so, you know, more sophisticated statistical methods like latent cluster analysis or even going to a point of artificial intelligence and machine learning will help us use the data that we have better uh, to help us uh, sort of uh, help better phenotype and understand our patients better to help then make these better recommendations and, and treatment moving forward. So that, that's kind of the next phase of work that we are trying to do as well, uh, to combine many of these data sets together, use artificial intelligence to see how we are able to uh, make better decisions. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think that really plays into the complex and very heterogeneous and mixed presentation amongst people that have osteoarthritis. And, you know, I think oftentimes our inability to A, recognize that these issues are there, or B, to disentangle what might be contributing most meaningfully. And obviously every individual who presents is unique and the contribution of some of these factors will vary dramatically uh, depending upon who that person is. Brian, that's wonderful. Now, in closing, can you, if you could do anything, you had a magic wand to improve health and healthcare. Um, and so this, you know, funding's limitless, you're a Harry Potter and you've just experienced the, the magic wand what would you choose to do if you could do anything for health and healthcare? I would bring health and social together. I would break the barriers down that exist between the healthcare institutions and the society at large and bring us all together to try and tackle you know, this health together. And it's not just a, a healthcare professional or uh, issue, but rather a whole society's uh, issue. And so if I had one wish is to break down barriers, that is the one wish I had. Yeah. Well, I, I, ho I hope you get there. And I hope, you know, I hope we start having more conversations about, you know, access to healthy food, appropriate transport, housing, um, you know, uh, standard things that we don't even think about on a regular basis and their important interactions with osteoarthritis. Now, how do you continue to learn in order to stay on top of things? Well, ha having podcasts like this are important. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know, by no seriousness, kind of having conversations with thought leaders like yourself, with other people attending conferences, really being at that the the cutting edge of what's happening, listening and hearing, of course, reading and understanding. You know, there's so much literature out, literature out there, and really trying to make an effort to synthesize and stay abreast of what's happening and in, in the latest uh, things. So many of these these podcasts, for example, you know, are really useful ways to try and uh, help us uh, in a very bite sized manner, right? Twenty minutes, half an hour. Give us sort of the latest ideas that are coming from the thought leaders in the field and then really try and see how it sort of integrates into some of the, the work that, that you are doing. And the second thing I would say, and this is where the clinician in me always comes, is to listen to your patients. Because at the end of the day, they are the motivation to what you do. That's number one. And number two, hearing their needs uh, really then drives their research agenda and a very ground up approach to, to doing things and doing research and doing any sort of clinical work. So I would say that that those are the kind of two things that I would advocate for. Wonderful. And, you know, I the reason I asked that question is I'm continuing to learn how to learn better. Um, <laughs> now, I, I, you may well have answered the next question, um, but what's your primary motivation? Why do you do what you do? I, well, I, I feel that, I mean, that's a bit of a philosophical question, but, uh, but I feel that we're all here on earth to do, uh, you know, you have a calling here on earth. And I feel that this is my calling and, and really is to make the lives of others better. If there's one thing you have to do in your life is to make the lives of others better. And so I, I do intend to give it my all, give it my 100%. Uh, and so I can give a good account of the life that I have. Well, it seems like you're doing a great job thus far. I hope you continue to maintain the enthusiasm and the motivation that you've got and continue to make the massive difference that you are. 
Brian, is there any one piece of advice, knowledge or wisdom that you'd like to give for people that have osteoarthritis? Yes, don't lose hope. Stay positive, stay active, stay mobile, and together we can beat osteoarthritis. That's my message to them. That's a wonderful way to close, Brian. Thank you so much for sharing those fantastic insights with us, a little bit of time, and looking forward to seeing you in your hometown very soon. Thank you very much, David. Thank you for having me on. Again, mental health and the important contributions of psychosocial aspects to the experience of pain are critical. They still remain under-recognized. And as a clinical community, we could do a hell of a lot better. But for people out there living with osteoarthritis, I think it's really key and essential to recognize that some of these key aspects, you know, whether that be fear of movement, depression, anxiety, contribute really meaningfully to your pain, to your disability, to your participation, and your ability to remain physically active. Please don't ignore it. Do your best to seek help from people willing and able to recognize that, and similarly, with a therapeutic intent to try to help you deal with many of those issues. If you ignore them, it is only to your detriment. And there's a lot that can be done, whether that be around assisting you with coping skills training, training about how best to deal with pain, as well as many other aspects of dealing with depression, anxiety, with cognitive behavioral therapy, stress, relaxation. There's lots of different opportunities for us to intervene. The worst thing that can be done is just ignoring it and paying attention to the concerns that you may have related to either social stigma or the need to internalize this and ignore its presence. So please go out, seek help. Again, thank you so much for your continued support of the Joint Action Podcast. Much of the wonderful work that Brian's done will include in the show notes. But between now and when we next have an opportunity to speak, please look after yourself. Thanks for listening to Joint Action with David Hunter. If you like our show and want to know more, visit www.jointaction.info. If you have any questions, you can email us at hello at jointaction.info and follow us on Twitter at jointactionorg. This podcast was hosted by David Hunter, edited by Vicky Duong, music produced by Jordan Hunter. The information posted on this podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. Anyone seeking medical advice should consult a health professional.